Today we will learn how industrialization affected American society in the late 19th century. We will also learn how people migrated from the countryside to cities and people from other countries came to the United States. Today's essential question is what economic, social, and political changes did urbanization bring to American cities? In the last unit, we learned how American industrialization increased its pace in the decades following the Civil War. Accelerating industrialization contributed to the process of urbanization, the movement of people from the countryside to towns and cities. City growth. An important result of industrialization was the rapid expansion of American cities. In 1865, only two U.S. cities actually had populations of more than 500,000, New York and Philadelphia. By 1900, that number had risen to six. Three of them, New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia, reached populations of more than one million inhabitants. By this time, 40% of Americans lived in cities, and the proportion kept growing. Several factors contributed to the rapid urban growth. The introduction of new farm machinery, such as Cyrus McCormick's Reaper, which cut and bundled grain, greatly reduced the number of farm jobs. Farmers and rural laborers sought work in towns and cities. At the same time, the rise of industry had created many new job opportunities. Workers were needed in factories, mines, and workshops, and for services like transport. Americans were also attracted to cities by their cultural opportunities, popular entertainments, and rich variety. Finally, the explosion in urban growth was further fueled by unprecedented levels of immigration. Cities face new problems. Urbanization led to physical changes in the landscape. Trees and fields were replaced by wood and brick buildings and by paved roads. American cities mushroomed so quickly that city authorities were often unable to deal adequately with all of their problems. Cities grew haphazardly. There were four major problems. Inadequate public services. Cities lacked the ability to, to deliver increased public services, hospitals, police forces, schools, fire departments, street cleaning, and garbage collection. Transportation. Horse-drawn coaches and later electric trolleys were needed to transport workers to their jobs. To eliminate the pollution created by coaches and trolleys, New York City built a subway in 1900. By 1930, New York City had the world's largest subway system. Overcrowding. Families were crowded into tenements, small apartment buildings. These tenements often lacked daylight, heat, fresh air, and adequate plumbing. And finally, social tensions. In cities, rich people lived next door to the poor. Seeing the luxuries of the wealthy distressed poor people and increased social tensions and crimes. Political machines. City governments were often run by corrupt political machines. The leaders of these machines were known as political bosses. Either the boss or a small group told the workers and supporters of the machine what to do. The machines often provided jobs and other services to immigrants and the poor in exchange for their votes. The power of the political boss depended upon its ability to dominate voting and to control the agencies of municipal government. The machines also often had the support of other local business leaders. By controlling elected officials and local government, political bosses were able to hand out government patronage jobs to reward loyal workers. The bosses then used their control of city hall to make illegal profits on city contracts or by collecting bribes. For example, Boss Tweed of Tammany Hall in New York City controlled thousands of city workers and influenced the operation of schools, hospitals, and other city-run services. Tweed benefited from the support of Irish immigrants. He controlled or bribed lawmakers to pass laws favorable to his interests. Tweed often overpaid himself on construction projects and land sales, stealing millions from the city. That's the building of our country right there, Mr. Cutting. Americans are borning. I don't see no Americans. I see trespassers. Irish hops. Do a job for a nickel what it does for a dime and a white man used to get a quarter for. What have they done? Name one thing they've contributed. Votes. Votes you say. When the Irish came, the city was in a fever. Since the time of the Great Famine, they'd come streaming off the boats. And they got a right warm welcome. Go back to Ireland, you dumb man! Do you remember that, you brother? He's back in the boat, Patty! I only came two hours downriver from Hellgate. But they all took me for an immigrant. Why not? There were 
a thousand different accents in New York and to the native, you see, it was all the same. Welcome to America, son. Your long, arduous journey is over. Go back to your country. Go Tammany! America for America! While the political machines were corrupt, they did play a useful role. They helped immigrants settle into new homeland, find housing, and obtain new jobs. They also helped immigrants become naturalized citizens and even provided money to help them through hard times. The political machines were often the ones to get a street paved, extend a water pipe, or approve construction, but these services came at a very high price. Immigration in the late 19th century, European immigrants flooded American cities in search of work and places to live. In many of the largest American cities, European immigrants even came to outnumber native-born Americans. Why Immigrants Came Immigrants have always come to the United States for a variety of reasons. Historians often divide these into push and pull factors. A desire to escape oppression, poverty, religious discrimination, or ethnic persecution pushed immigrants out of their homelands. A belief that America offered freedom and economic opportunity, as well as ties to relatives already living here, generally pulled immigrants to these shores. They saw the United States as a land of unbounded opportunities. Immigrants who fled oppressive regimens in Europe yearned to live in a democratic society like the United States. Shifting Patterns of Immigration Before 1880, most immigrants came to America came from parts of Northern Europe especially Great Britain, Ireland, and Germany. In general, these immigrants were Protestant, except for large numbers of Irish Catholics. Most of these early immigrants also spoke English. The New Immigrants from 1880 to 1920. Patterns of immigration changed in the 1880s. The construction of railroad across Europe and the appearance of large ocean-going steamships made the voyage to America more accessible to many Europeans. Most of these new immigrants came from southern and eastern Europe, especially Poland, Italy, Austria-Hungary, Greece, and Russia. They were often Catholic, Jewish, or Orthodox Christian rather than Protestant, and most spoke no English. The Immigrant Experience Immigrants in the late 19th century usually faced great hardships, beginning with their passage to America. They traveled in steerage in an open room below the waterline, often with their life often with their life's belonging in a single bag. On a clear day, they assembled on the ship's deck for sunshine and fresh air. Most first arrived in New York City, where they were processed at the vast government center on Ellis Island in New York Harbor. Those with tuberculosis or other diseases were sent back. The new immigrants either stayed in New York City or took trains to join their relatives in other parts of the country. Most settled in cities. They were usually poor, dressed differently from other Americans, and were very unfamiliar with American customs. They moved into crowded tenement buildings and worked at unskilled jobs for long hours at low pay. They often faced hostility and discrimination from native-born Americans and even from other different immigrant, immigrant groups. For over 20 million people, Ellis Island was the gateway to the American dream. From 1892 to 1954, it was the headquarters for U.S. immigration. The people who arrived there brought to life the Statue of Liberty's inscription, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And they came. At a rate of about a million a year, immigrants arrived in New York City's harbor from every country in the world. Ellis Island was dubbed Heartbreak Island. Families would be separated if members had a history of crime political agitation, or contagious disease. Many could not face deportation, and it's estimated that thousands committed suicide. For many immigrants, the voyage to Ellis Island meant selling all personal possessions, plus additional debt, just to buy the fare. After weeks crammed into the overcrowded steerage of a ship on the stormy Atlantic, Ellis Island represented the final Despite these hardships, there was often a strong spirit of optimism among many immigrants. Many had already survived far worse conditions in the countries where they came from. 
If America was not everything they had hoped for, they appreciated that there were new opportunities for both themselves and their children. Ethnic Ghettos To cope with their problems, immigrants usually settled with relatives and others of the same nationality in ethnic neighborhoods, known as ghettos. These immigrants felt more comfortable around those who spoke the same language and who followed the same customs as themselves. In their own communities, immigrants could speak their native language, attend their own church, churches and synagogues, and be among relatives and friends from the old country. Some of these communities even published newspapers in their own native language. However, living in these ethnic ghettos also isolated immigrants from mainstream American life, making it even harder for them to adopt new customs. The process of Americanization. While some adult immigrants attended night school to learn English, most were too busy working and caring for their families to spend time learning a new language or culture. It was left to their children to learn English and become Americanized, learning to dress, speak, and act like other Americans. These immigrant children eventually became assimilated, similar to other Americans. America was seen as a melting pot in which immigrants were melted down and reshaped. America's public schools greatly assisted in this process. Often, Americanization was accomplished by conflict. For example, immigrant parents might desire an arranged marriage for their children, while their children insisted on finding their own marriage partners according to the American custom. The Rise of Nativism As the flood of immigrants grew, hostility to immigration also mounted. Nativists, or those born or native to the United States, wanted to restrict immigration. Nativists believed that people of other races, religions, and nationalities were inferior, and that the new immigrants were especially inferior to white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant Americans. Nativists feared the new immigrants could never be fully absorbed into American society since they lived in ghettos and spoke their own languages. Finally, nativists argued that immigrants working for low wages would take away jobs from other Americans. Early Restrictions on Immigration For most of the 19th century, there were no limits at all on immigration to the United States. Anyone who was healthy and could afford to come here was permitted to immigrate. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was the first federal law to restrict immigration to the United States. It reflected American prejudices at the same time, excuse me, at the time against Asians. In California, political leaders blamed unemployment and a general decline in wages on the presence of Chinese workers. The law temporarily banned the immigration of Chinese workers and placed new restrictions on Chinese residents already living in the United States. These residents had to obtain a special certificate before leaving the United States if they planned to re-enter. State and federal courts were denied the ability to grant citizenship to Chinese residents. American leaders carefully negotiated with Chinese governments in order to enforce this ban.